All right, let's talk about a very basic concept that we all take for granted, but we need to understand where the units come from in our systems, or at least we need to have some appreciation for units of measurement. And why is that? That is because everything is relative, right? And because everything is relative, we need to have a universal agreement, right? In other words, the engineer in Europe needs to understand exactly what the engineer in Asia or in America has to say or wants to express. And so we need to agree on a unit and what that unit really means. So we cannot use the random unit of one Raphael, of course, in this class we can, but in real life you need some universal agreement. And the things we need agreement on are actually threefold in engineering mechanics or in mechanics. And those are expressions for the lengths. We need something that defines the lengths. We need something that defines mass. And we need something that defines time. Because those three units are actually sufficient to describe everything else, believe it or not. We can derive all other units. And in the SI system, so in SI, we call this, as you know, of course, meter. Then the mass is actually the kilogram. And then we have seconds. So this is important to understand that here the mass is defined and the mass has actually a prefix in it. The kilo is actually a prefix. I will come back to that in a second. However, this system here is known to be the MKS system, right? So this is MKS system. And that is what engineering students often prefer. And they say, hey, I prefer the metric system, but you need to understand we're not talking about the metric system, we're talking about the SI system. The SI system and the metric system, of course, go hand in hand with each other, but really the SI system is the system that defines the unit. And I will talk about each one of these in a second, just to give you something to talk about on your next engineering party. But you need to understand that this is not metric, right? The meter is not metric. The kilo is metric, actually, but the gram is not. The second is not metric either. So what I'm trying to express to you is that there's a difference between a unit and its prefix. And the definition of the units is what we really need to agree on. The prefix we can apply to everything. So for example, here you see an inch scale and then here you see the centimeter scale. Of course, one centimeter is very different from one inch, but I could, of course, create a kilo inch or like a mega inch and so on. And that would be found in the metric system then. So you could have a metric inch if you want to. However, the system international or the international system of units as it's actually called right so let's write that down so this here is called the international system of units actually defines these units in conjunction with the prefixes so really the international system of units is considered the modern form of the metric system. So let's write that down. And in that metric system, everything is designed around the number 10, right? So designed around 10. So that means you usually have 10 to the power of something. You already saw me using that before when I described the radius of the earth or the radius of an atom. I used 10 to the power of something. And the reason the metric system is considered nice often is actually not because of the units, it's actually because of the prefixes. And that this is the kilogram stands for 10 to the power of three. 
and the mega to t for 10 to the power of 6 and so on and so forth. But let's first dive in and talk real quick about each of these units because it's so fun to think about that as an engineer. And I just want to give you some side notes here. So for example, the meter itself, right? The meter, I want you to think about how the meter is defined or if you know this. And I really like how it was traditionally defined. Nowadays, of course, it's a diff different definition, but the very first definition of the meter was actually derived from a distance measurement on the Earth. So distance from the equator to the North Pole. in a straight line through Paris. And then you take that distance and you would divide it by 10 million. So it's a 10 millionth part of that distance. And I think that's genius because everybody technically can recreate this, although it would be fairly difficult for some of us, but at least conceptually speaking, it's a genius idea at the time. This was derived in 1791. And at that time, it was a way to standardize it such that everybody could validate it and it would be a defined measurement. Of course, this was then later changed and adjustments were made in 1927. And then later on, we had much better technology. So for example, in 1960, we used the wavelengths of light, right? So wave lengths of light. And then some slight changes were made, but really we're still using the concept that was developed in 1960 and technology got a little bit better and we have higher precision so that now we're looking at the light distance traveled in one divided by three times 10 to the eight meters. So that's 300 millions of a second. And we can measure that precisely now. But this is something which, of course, is not super relevant to mechanics. I just like this from an engineering standpoint because this is something that had to be invented out of nowhere. And this really shows ingenuity. And I think we as engineers can all appreciate that. So let's now talk about the kilogram and the mass. And the mass I'm talking about here is one kilogram. And the one kilogram was initially defined in 1800, so in the 18th century, as the mass of one liter of water. And that is, of course, not ultimately true anymore nowadays, because as we know, water changes its density with temperature. And also we have other things to consider when it comes to water. So they adjusted this later on. I will talk about those adjustments in a second. But what's important is that this is almost still true. So one liter of water has the mass of one kilogram. And why do I like this as an engineer? Because we all are familiar with the mass of one kilogram because we all have seen one liter bottles or half a liter bottles in vending machines for like our soda drinks and so on. And so I intuitively know that I can lift one kilogram. Sometimes I meet students that say, hey, I didn't grow up in the metric system, so I ha have no feel for the kilogram. But here it is. Here's your kilogram feeling. You know that one liter of water is something you can lift, is something you have control over and you have a feel for how that kilogram works. And again, we don't use this nowadays anymore. We actually now use a prototype or even that got outdated now, but for the longest time in 1889, 
we developed a prototype And pretty much that is just a specimen that was made from platinum iridium and it was just declared as the reference mass. So think of this as a reference. And that thing sits in Paris, now in a museum. It's sometimes also called the Ur mass. And that Ur mass is really what we, for the longest time, balanced everything against. Nowadays, uh, they made changes to that, but let's not worry about those. I just think this here, the one kilogram per one liter is important. In fact, you will see in today's lecture why this is important for mechanics, because we can use this as a load on our structures and we can understand how our loads work. But more on that in just a second. Now we also have the seconds, talking about seconds, right? So we have the second which was initially defined by the mean solar year. And that mean solar year was then divided into some fractions, in this case into 86,400 fractions, but we will not worry about those details here. And then there was adjustments made and then we did it based on the tropical year. And nowadays we do it based on the cesium 133. So now, so today it has something to do with cesium 133 atom. And really it has something to do with the radiation that is corresponding to the transition between two some ground states but that goes way beyond this class here and i just wanted to add this here for completeness reason these two things here i wanted to talk about because they make engineering sense to us and we can really visualize that and we could even recreate it in one way or the other and please note again i said it before that the kilogram actually has a kilo in it so it's not just the entity that's described by the gram is also having a prefix. So let's now quickly talk about the prefix because that is something we need in our work. So we have SI prefixes and really they make our life easier. They reduce our workload or our writing effort. So they reduce writing effort why because they are a multiple of three usually so like i said 10 to the power of n and then so we have 10 to the power of 3 10 to the power of 9 or maybe even 10 to the power of minus 9 and so on and so forth and you see some prefixes here in this table that i created for you and of course we need to complete this table so for example the mega here is 10 to the power of 6 and then we also have the centi which is 10 to the power of minus 2 that's a very uncommon one here in america but is very common in europe um, we also need to understand that they all have certain names to them that you see here in the second column so there's a prefix name so a micro for example would be 10 to the minus 6 and then we have the nano here on the bottom we know that and all these symbols or the 10 to the power or the prefix replace a decimal and i'll be very honest with you when i did my undergraduate degree i still refuse to use these entities here on the left side and i kept writing the decimals because i thought this more this is more precise for whatever reason but that's complete bogus because that everything after the fourth digit is irrelevant anyways we talked about this in the zero lecture when we talked about four significant figures and so a lot of this is unnecessary writing effort and that's why engineers technically prefer this and the reason i told you about my undergraduate is because later on i actually made an effort to really study and learn these and it really made my life easier and i hated myself for not knowing that sooner so i recommend that you forget about these don't use these anymore and move your effort to 
the prefixes or the symbols. And of course, we know that here now we need to add another 0.01 and then here the 0.1 is a tenth. And now we have that completed. And therefore, we now have a solid understanding of the units of measurements. Let me just tell you here on a side note that we also, of course, have the imperial system and my students in the classroom often dislike it, but we have to know how to deal with both. So, for example, we have one foot, right, which is equal to 12 inch. And then we have three foot, which is equal to one yard. And then we have 1760 yard, which is equal to one mile. I don't know who decided to keep this system because it is really tedious sometimes, as you can see here, they should have at least turned it into like a kilo foot instead of like a mile or something like that, or maybe a kilo yard, I don't know, something like that. It would have made our life easier, but this is what it is. And to be honest, if you know how to handle both of them, more power to you. It actually helps you to understand the world better, at least from an engineering standpoint. Now we also have the weight, and so I want you to understand that in the imperial system we have weight and not mass, right? So the weight is actually defined in pounds, so the unit is pounds, and the corresponding mass would be a slug, right? So there's a slug that defines mass in the imperial system, but it's not a base unit, please understand that. And of course, time is also in seconds, by the way, time in seconds. So that's no different. But of course, you knew all that. Um, so let's just go ahead and move on to our Newton's laws now. I will see you for that on the next page.